Hello, and welcome to Our Ventura TV. I'm MB Hanrahan, and today, my guest and friend, total disclosure, is Dina Pile. Dina is a photographer extraordinaire, a graphic artist, a publisher, and an entrepreneur local to Ventura, California. So Dina, but the reason I brought you here today is to talk with you about your self-proclaimed, taken on role as an end-of-life doula. Could you explain? Well, as you know, a doula is somebody that gives birth. That's or, how it's defined a, in Wikipedia, yes? It, it assists in, in the birth. Non-medical. Non-medical. Uh, an end-of-life doula is, um, from my perspective, mm -hmm. somebody that helps uh, another person through transition and death and thus giving birth to their soul, birthing their soul. Wow. I well, mean, I, I believe that when the body dies, uh, the consciousness continues fully intact. So it works for me. The, the description works for me. Very cool. It's, that sounds amazing. And how does someone come about becoming an end-of-life doula? Well, it, it, it takes uh, certain uh, classes and workshops and mm. certification processes. But the most important part of the journey is, is actually having hands-on experience. So this is like a calling for you. This is a calling. This is something that is um, absolutely fulfilling to me. This is my passion quest. And I, 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 my father is the one who got me into this. Ah. He, was, he was my first end-of-life caregiving case. Your and client. He was, he was my first client. And I ended up uh, spending the last 91 days of his life. Wow after getting him set up in a uh, hospice with Livingston at his home. You know, I, I have 12 brothers and sisters, and my father chose me to be his primary caregiver. My mother couldn't do it. I mean, it was just too much for her. So people have, have actually invited you to do this. This is, this is something where they find out that I have um, a gift for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it. It feels like a place I need to be and they, they call me or email me, some people I know, some people I don't know, and I, um, w once I arrive into their life, uh, it usually becomes a, uh, it, near the end, a 24-7 commitment. Wow. And it is where I am really locked into a person in transition. Uh, their psyche, their, their, mm. their emotional, um, uh, reality uh, and also often the family doesn't want to have to do with uh, uh, dispensing medication it's scary to them oh, interesting. so I have learned to provide uh, medicinal caregiving with permission of the family right. and the person following the directives in a way that allows them to have quality of life mm. and participation in their life uh, while also being as comfortable as they can near the end of life. Well, what strikes me, and you kind of mentioned it, is that it's one thing often, here's, here's a person in a transitional place, but there's nurses around, and then there's family members around. So I'm thinking that you're also just intuitively, I'm imagining that you are kind of coordinating these personalities and you're probably helping the people that are gonna be alive after the process as much as the person who's moving on, as they say. Yes, it's an extraordinary journey, and the, the village that surrounds there we go. somebody who is dying and near end of death uh, tends to grow, and, uh, but often people don't know what to do. They want to be guided. They want to be a part of it. And, and honestly, I've been told so many times once a person does take their last breath, uh, the journey doesn't end there. Um, during the process, uh, there's a certain amount of documentation if, if they want. I, mm. I'm, a, I'm a videographer, so sure. I will, with their permission, shoot photos and video of the family and, 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 and their loved one who's dying. And so it, it becomes a, a real learning process for everybody. My goal is that whoever wants to participate uh, in the final caregiving mm -hmm. of their loved one, it, it, that is 
part of the, the teaching, the mentoring process of it. It's not just helping somebody have what I call a good death. Mm -hmm. And a good death is when, when that person takes their last breath, they're ready emotionally, they're ready spiritually if necessary, um, and they are as comfortable as can be. Uh, but also the family who's present in the room. I do something called an end of life plan, or at least I try to work with the family mm -hmm. on what's called an end of life plan. And in essence, that means to the dying person, how do you want your environment to be around you? How do right, you want so it's not happening accidentally or just spontaneous. It's, it's happening because there's some consciousness. I mean, that, yeah. to me, consciousness and compassion are like underlying everything you're saying. But please, continue. No, absolutely. It's, it's, you know, I have an end of life plan. It's, it's part of the process. I have a really good end of life plan. <laughs> it is really cool. But what I try to do is encourage the person who's dying is really, dying is a very personal thing. You know, we come in this world alone, in essence, with the help of doctors and all, but we're, we're coming into this world as a single individual. Mm -hmm. We leave this world alone. It's a very private personal thing but we're surrounded by people who care and love us yes so the first step is is it's really important to find out what the person who is dying wants how do they want their environment to be do they want to be inside when they're still conscious when when you while can do that while they're able while we're able to interact now sometimes i'm i'm called to duty mm -hmm. near the very very end when somebody is mostly semi-unconscious right and that means really working with the family uh, walking into an environment seeing how things are set up I mean it's simple things like if somebody's on an oxygen machine that machine is really noisy right you can move the machine out of the room into a more quiet place and turn on their favorite music mm. you can encourage family members to cuddle to literally get in bed with a dying person and hold them. Even though somebody may be semi-conscious or even seemingly unconscious, their sense of hearing and feeling right. is still fully intact. So they just can't respond. Th that is excellent. I mean, to me, it strikes me as, not to sound simplistic, but any of those extreme emotional uh, life points, you know, birth, weddings, and such like that, death, we'll just say the word, death, where people, the way they respond when they're in the situation, they can say all sorts of stuff <laughs> prior, but when you're actually in the situation, emotions are running high, there could be all sorts of other stuff going on, and yeah. to have someone in the room who is committed and yet removed from the drama, whether it's family drama or whatever, just seems to me like amazing. And I'm going to say right now, I know you've been doing this on a, as a volunteer and in so a completely, completely nonprofit way. But it, it seems like the word needs to get out just about like what you're talking about. And my understanding is that you are in the process of creating the End of Life Academy. Can you talk about that? Because you're one person <laughs> and yet this, this needs to be known and possibly taught. End of Life Academy is a way of providing the service that I described, mm -hmm. but it's also a resource for education. People want to be involved in the death of their loved before one. The end, before it's too late, as they say, right? Exa exactly. So some of, some of the things that End of Life Academy will do is mentor people mm -hmm. on how to be a good caregiver. Look, more and more people are going to have to die at home. We, we, we are already at um, a senior population, uh, 65 and, and, and older. That's 30% of our current Ventura County population. We have something called the silver tsunami. And what that means is, before you know it, we'll be 40% of the population. Right. And that includes you and me. Yeah, I got it. So, um, and not everybody who dies or that I've taken through end of life is 65 and older. There are younger people too. Sure. but. Uh, we have to be prepared to be able to provide comfort and caregiving in our homes, 
hospitals are not going to be able to keep up with it. Yeah, so, I'm just going to say it. I don't really feel that this kind, of, these kind of conversations happen enough in our culture. I, I, <laughs> we're, there, there is gross a, understatement right there. <laughs> there, there. The, one of the one of the the biggest stumbling blocks is the fear attached to dying. Not, it's fearful when you find out you're dying, and there's a certain process that one has to go through to be at peace before they die. I call and, it the final blessing. And trust it people happens, around you. I see it time and time again where there's at one point a complete acceptance of dying. And then the other part is the family, the, the loved ones, they have a fear mm. of what to, what's gonna happen. I mean, what's it gonna look like? It's the unknown. What's it gonna feel like? What, what, uh, I'm scared. You mm -hmm. know, there's this fear factor. Here's my, here's my thought about all okay. of this. If we, we were born, not just to live, but to die. Mm -hmm. And if we all got that really into our head, I am living, but I'm also dying the minute I'm born. I think people would live their life more fully, and I think people would be more kind to each other. Mm. So part of End of Life Academy is to have not just an acceptance of quality of life at end of life, mm -hmm. and a way to achieve that, and a way to teach that, and, and a way to provide that if, they, you know, if, that's what they, if that's what a love, a family wants, or a person who's dying wants. We want, Joe Cardella is somebody that we all know and love. And last February, he asked me to be his end of life doula because he knew what my passion is. And I said, of course. And that acceptance that he was dying, he wanted help through the process. But true peace and acceptance didn't happen until his last week of life. Mm when he started really having the deep conversations with me. So wh what I'm trying to say is if we could all get our mind around the fact that death is going to happen and it is not a scary thing. It's part of life. We can provide more caregiving through life to our loved ones with the understanding that this may be the last time I see you. Radical self-acceptance of our expiration date. Yes, <laughs> it, maybe we'll see that on a bumper sticker. But what I'd like to, what I'd like to, before we wrap up here, is I really would like people to know how to get in touch with you because, yes, your this nonprofit is going to is is a reality. Even though it's it's just you right now, <laughs> it's it is a reality, and it's going to be a bigger reality. So how do people contact you to get this going and to get this nonprofit in the place it needs to be? Well, um, first of all, it's really important to understand that I don't want to charge money for this. And the reason a nonprofit will uh, become right. more of a reality is so that I can provide end of life care. Exactly. For free. Uh, exactly. Money is bad chi for death. So <laughs> with, that, with that said, I have a URL I just registered called eola-online.org. Okay. And EOLA stands for End of Life Academy. Very good. The uh, website's not in place yet. That will happen in December. Eventually, uh, yes. For right now, um, or eventually, yeah. For right now, they can email me at dina at dinapie.org. Dinapie.org, we'll remember that. Dina, I wanna thank you so much. Uh, a challenging subject, but I'm gonna use the word challenging because we need to be challenged because it's a reality. Thank you so much, my friend. And thank you, my friends, for joining us on Arventura TV. My name is MB Hanrahan, and we'll see you again soon.